The religion of the Vedas. Pre-Vedic religion. Vedic gods. Moral gods. The Vedic story of creation. Immortality. The horse sacrifice. The oldest known religion of India, which the invading Aryans found among the Nagas, and which still survives in the ethnic nooks and crannies of the Great Peninsula, was apparently an animistic and totemic worship of multitudinous spirits dwelling in stones and animals, in trees and streams, in stars and mountains. Snakes and serpents were divinities, idols and ideals of virile reproductive power. And the sacred Bodhi tree of Buddhist time was a vestige of the mystic but wholesome reverence for the quiet majesty of trees. Naga, the dragon god, Hanuman, the monkey god, Nandi, the divine bull, and the Yakshas, or tree gods, passed down into the religion of historic India. Since some of these spirits were good and some evil, only great skill in magic could keep the body from being possessed or tortured in sickness or mania by one or more of the innumerable demons that filled the air. Hence the medley of incantations in the Athurva Veda, or Book of Knowledge of Magic. One must recite spells to obtain children, to avoid abortion, to prolong life, to ward off evil, to woo sleep, and to destroy or harass enemies. The earliest gods of the Vedas were the forces and elements of nature herself. Sun, sky, earth, fire, light, wind, water, and sex. Dios, the Greek Zeus, the Roman Jupiter, was at first the sky itself, and the Sanskrit word Deva, which later was to mean divine, originally meant only bright. By that poetic license which makes so many deities, these natural objects were personified. The sky, for example, became a father, Varuna. The earth became a mother, Prithivi. And vegetation was the fruit of their union through the rain. The rain was the god Parjanya, fire was Agni, the wind was Vayu, the pestilential wind was Rudra, the storm was Indra, the dawn was Ushas, the furrow in the field was Sita, the sun was Surya, Mitra, or Vishnu, and the sacred Soma plant, whose juice was at once holy and intoxicating to gods and men, was itself a god, the Hindu Dionysus, inspiring man by its exhilarating essence to charity, insight, and joy, and even bestowing upon him eternal life. A nation, like an individual, begins with poetry and ends with prose. And as things became persons, so qualities became objects, adjectives became nouns, epithets became deities. The life-giving sun became a new sun god, Savitar the life-giver. The shining sun became Vivisvat, shining god. The life-generating sun became the great god Prajapati, lord of all living things. An almost monotheistic devotion was accorded to Prajapati until he was swallowed up, in later theology, by the all-consuming figure of Brahma. For a time, the most important of the Vedic gods was Agni, fire. He was the sacred flame that lifted the sacrifice to heaven. He was the lightning that pranced through the sky. He was the fiery life and spirit of the world. But the most popular figure in the pantheon was Indra, wielder of thunder and storm. For Indra brought to the Indo-Aryans that precious rain, which seemed to them even more vital than the sun. Therefore they made him the greatest of the gods, invoked the aid of his thunderbolts in their battles, and pictured him enviously as a gigantic hero feasting on bulls by the hundreds, and lapping up lakes of wine. His favorite enemy was Krishna, who in the Vedas was as yet only the local god of the Krishna tribe. Vishnu, the sun who covered the earth with his strides, was also a subordinate god, unaware that the future belonged to him and to Krishna, his avatar. This is one value of the Vedas to us, that through them we see religion in the making and can follow the birth, growth, and death of gods and beliefs, from animism to philosophical pantheism 
and from the superstitions of the Atharva Veda to the sublime monism of the Upanishads. These gods are human in figure and motive and almost in ignorance. One of them, besieged by prayers, ponders what he should give his devotee, quote, This is what I will do. No, not that. I will give him a cow. Or shall it be a horse? I wonder if I have really had Soma from him. End quote. Some of them, however, rose in later Vedic days to a majestic moral significance. Varuna, who began as the encompassing heaven, whose breath was the storm and whose garment was the sky, grew with the development of his worshippers into the most ethical and ideal deities of the Vedas. Watching over the world with his great eye, the sun, punishing evil, rewarding good, and forgiving the sins of those who petitioned him. In this aspect, Varuna was the custodian and executor of an eternal law called Rita. This was at first the law that established and maintained the stars in their courses. Gradually, it became also the law of right, the cosmic and moral rhythm which every man must follow if he would not go astray and be destroyed. As the number of gods increased, the question arose as to which of them had created the world. This primal role was assigned now to Agni, now to Indra, now to Soma, now to Prajapati. One of the Upanishads attributed the world to an irrepressible pro-creator. Quote, Verily he had no de delight. One alone had no delight. He desired a second. He was indeed as large as a woman and a man closely embraced. He caused that self to fall, vipat, into two pieces. Therefore arose a husband, pati, and a wife, patni. Therefore, one self is like a half fragment. Therefore this space is filled by a wife. He copulated with her. Therefore human beings were produced. And she bethought herself, how now does he copulate with me? After, he's pre after he has produced me just from himself. Come, let me hide myself. She became a cow. He became a bull. With her he had, did indeed copulate. Then cattle were born. She became a mare. He a stallion. She became a female ass. He a male ass. With her he copulated of a truth. Thence were born solid hoofed, solid hoofed animals. She became a she goat. He a he goat. She an ewe. He a ram. With her did he verily copulate. Therefore were born goats and sheep. Thus indeed he created all, whatever pairs there are, even down to the ants. He knew, I indeed am this creation, for I emitted it all from myself. Thus arose creation." End quote. In this unique passage we have the germ of pantheism and transmigration. The creator is one with his creation, and all things all forms of life are one. Every form was once another form, and is distinguished from it only in the prejudice of perception and the superficial separateness of time. This view, though ultimately formulated in the Upanishads, was not yet in Vedic days a part of the popular creed. Instead, a transmigration, instead of transmigration, the Indo-Aryans, like the Aryans of Persia, accepted a simple belief in personal immortality. After death, the soul entered into eternal punishment or happiness. It was thrust by Varuna into a dark abyss, half Hades and half Hell, or was raised by Yama into a heaven where every earthly joy was made complete and endless. Like corn decays the mortal, said the Kapha Upanishad, like corn is he born again. In the earlier Vedic religions, there were, so far as the evidence goes, no images and no temples. Altars were put up anew for each sacrifice, as in Zoroastrian Persia, and sacred fire lifted the offering to heaven. Vestiges of human sacrifice occur here, as at the outset of almost every civilization, but they are few and uncertain. Again, as in Persia, the horse was sometimes burnt as an offering to the gods. The strangest ritual of all was the Ashma Eda, 
or sacrifice of the horse, in which the queen of the tribe seemed to have copulated with the sacred horse after it had been killed. Ponobatque in Gremian Regina Genital Victim My Membrum. The usual offering was a libation of soma juice and the pouring of liquid butter into the fire. The sacrifice was conceived for the most part in magical terms. If it were properly performed, it would win its reward, regardless of the moral deserts of the worshipper. The priest charged heavily for helping the pious in the ever more complicated ritual of sacrifice. If no fee was at hand, the priest refused to recite the necessary formulas. His payment had to come before that of the god. Rules were laid down by the clergy as to what the remuneration should be for each service, how many horses or cows, or how much gold. Gold was particularly efficacious in moving the priest to the god. The brahmanas, written by the brahmins, instructed the priest how to turn the prayer or sacrifice secretly to the hurt of those who had employed him if they had given him an inadequate fee. Other regulations were issued, prescribing the proper ceremony and usage for almost every occasion of life, in usually requiring priestly aid. Slowly the Brahmins became a privileged hereditary caste, holding the mental and spiritual life of India under a control that threatened to stifle all thought and change.